am Corey Shockey, the Deputy Director General of the IISS, and this is Sound Strategic, our house uh, podcast to showcase the excellence and breadth and diversity and depth of excellence of our analysts. And today I have the great good fortune to have with me Antonio Sampaio, who is in the Conflict Security and Development Program. He has a background as a journalist, uh, was an editor at Globo TV in Rio de Janeiro before coming to us, but he also publishes widely in the Financial Times, Foreign Policy, uh, and the Washington Post. He's an expert on illicit economies and uh, fragility of urban centers, and he is uh, going to talk this morning about a terrific report he's just published. Antonio, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Corey. Yeah, so um, this report that um, has just come out is called uh, Illicit Order, the Militarized Logic of Organized Crime and uh, Public Security in Rio. So it's based on some field research I've done last year in Rio de Janeiro, and it focuses on the uh, territorial control exercised by criminal groups in Rio. So it, it aims to analyze why is it that Rio has such an extreme form of criminal violence that different from many other Latin American cities that are very, very violent, in Rio it reaches um, um, a very uh, severe level in which these criminal groups, they control territories, being the slums, the favelas, the hillside slums. And not only do they control by establishing rules and intimidating inhabitants, but they exhibit high caliber rifles in broad daylight. Um, and I've seen with my own eyes during this field research when I went there, you know, kids that are probably underage, around 16, 17, with rifles. Uh, and they do that in order to deter, dissuade the rivals from invading their territories uh, and to guard the very lucrative um, drug trade territories. So that's where they sell the drugs to the wealthy uh, elite of Rio that, and the, the suppliers that go to the slums to, to buy the drugs. And they also they get a kick out of, uh, of having power and control over people. Um, so the report was really uh, an attempt to understand how this territorial control took shape and why the security policies and the organized crime in Rio have become so militarized so uh, aggressive and um, based on, on, on constant uh, gunfights, battles on the streets. Almost every, every week in Rio de Janeiro you see gun battles for territorial control in which gangs attempt to conquer another territory. So it's sort of a primitive state building kind of thing. Uh, okay, so I have a bunch of questions. The first two are, What's different about this from gang violence of drug cartels along the U.S.-Mexican border or uh, operating in and out of Colombia? What specifically makes the, this uh, burgeoning of violence in Rio de Janeiro different? Yeah. Rio is different because of the concentrated character of the violence. Um, that is um, uh, very highly um, concentrated in, in a few large slums. So these are den densely populated areas um, that have had decades of uh, a long history of state abandonment, of marginalization. So without um, the security, any form of public security, any form of um, reliable public governance, um, you know, access to jobs, access to education, access to public provided uh, policing, uh, or at least good policing. Um, these territories became, since the emergence of the Medellin cartel and the international cocaine trade in the 80s, uh, the domain of these criminal organizations. And another factor that is very in interesting and very not very well um, understood by, by, by outsiders is that the Red Command, which is the criminal group that is currently the, the main uh, drug trafficking organization in Rio, it had a background 
in, in, in a sort of guerrilla warfare. So they originated in a prison in the south of Rio where they were, the leaders were in prison alongside guerrilla members that were sent there by the then um, military regime that ruled Rio. And this is documented in books written by the, the, the Red Command uh, founders, but also by journalists afterwards, saying how common criminals uh, started learning organizational uh, organization techniques and also some tactical maneuvers. And it reached the point in which uh, some of the prisoners were caught with copies of the um, uh, uh, guerrilla warfare literature and the mini manual for uh, guerrilla warfare by Antonio Marighella, who is uh, a Brazilian author who authored this, um, this book on guerrilla techniques in, in cities. Okay, so two things strike me as common uh, to operation of drug cartels in other places and to gang activity in other places. The first is the failure of governance. That is, there is an urgent need for the provision of basic security that the, that the rightful state government fails to provide, and so criminal organizations move in and provide, a, so even if it's a brutal justice, it's predictable, it creates um, basic stability. That sounds common to the operation of ISIS, the yeah. operation of drug cartels, the, yeah. uh, even the operation of the Muslim Brotherhood or the IRA. Yeah. Uh, the second thing that sounds common to me in a broader set of cases than the one that you're looking at is the, uh, the use of prisons as training grounds, especially for the Mexican drug cartels these guys were in prison in Los Angeles, and mm. that's where they learned their tradecraft. Um, so uh, what lessons do you think are more broadly applicable from the case that you look at in illicit order? Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the main purpose of studying the case of Rio is to draw these lessons and learn some uh, 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 what is similar to, to, to other settings. And um, one of the reasons that the case of Rio has become so prominent among students and uh, international uh, organizations uh, in terms of urban security is that it was um, during the late 2000 and early 2010s, it implemented a very successful urban security stabilization strategy, was, which was called pacification. The, pacifying police units, UPPs. Mm -hmm. And um, what I cite in this report is that uh, at the time, uh, the World Bank released a highly uh, um, positive report showing how it is a, a lesson for other cities around the world. So it established a um, joint security and development program in the slums in which police officers, heavily armed police officers, the military police, and sometimes with the help of the armed forces, they entered slums and they would say openly that it was an occupation. So it was the occupation phase of the slum, uh, uh, followed by, um, at least in theory, uh, developmental and governance um, uh, policies. So a very symbolic um, ceremony that happened after the state occupied the slums was that they would go to the top of the slum, because they, they were usually hillside, and they would raise the Brazilian flag. So it was a, a sort of a symbolic gesture mm -hmm. that a, a, a very uh, actually not so symbolic recognition of uh, by the Brazilian state that he had not controlled those territories before and were, were now mm -hmm. occupying it. Um, so I think these, uh, one of the reasons why the case of Rio is so useful as a case study for other areas is that it has had this policy that worked so well. And the other reason is what you mentioned, that it is an extreme case of um, a similar phenomenon that happens throughout Latin America um, of failure of governance um, and, uh, and, and how that paves the way for violent actors, yeah. violent entrepreneurs to take over. It's such an interesting parallel to counterinsurgency doctrine. Yes, right? and I do I mention in the report oh really? that uh, there was a WikiLeaks cable uh, in which US diplomats in, based in Rio um, called the, the pacification a case of counterinsurgency. And it was also compared to peacekeeping. Uh, so there, were, there are several, and, and I interviewed the security secretary um, that was the author of the, the, the policy, called his, his name is Jose Mariano Beltrami. And what he says about 
we need to have the allegiance of the population. We need to uh, um, focus on the on gaining the support of the population and less on the on the military type of thing. And it, it is very similar to the population-centric counterinsurgency strategies. That's really interesting. And how does it connect to the research trips you are about to take that are making me so nervous? <laughs> yeah. So um, after I, I've 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 uh, I've focused quite a bit on Latin America, especially Colombia and Brazil in terms of urban security and violence, organized crime. And I really wanted to um, develop and and try to investigate how these phenomenon, let's say, of um, um, non-state armed groups in cities manifested in other areas and what my lessons that I took from Latin America and am still taking um, can be useful, can be applied in other settings. So we got the support of the Department for International Development here in the UK to do a project called Urban Sources of Fragility, um, which um, focuses on the, source, the, the sources of armed conflict and political violence that either originate or are amplified in cities. So uh, the objective is to get us thinking about conflict prevention in cities. So, uh, you know, the US and the UN and several international actors, when they, they, they decided they want to do state building or um, promote security in a country like Somalia or Afghanistan, they look at the country and they engage with the national actors, the national, and our objective with this project is to see what is specific about cities. So policies like urban planning and sewage systems and things like that that um, are very specific about cities, but not just that, like the security sector reform in a city is much mm -hmm. different from, from, from a state level, sort of building the armed forces, building the national police. Uh, it, it is in the city that you're able to build uh, a security strategy or a security force that engages with local communities uh, because it is the, the, the local authorities that are, have this frontline role of engaging the, uh, the local communities, the local leaders, and gathering their, their views and the, their preoccupations. And how did you get interested in this kind of work? So I grew up in Rio. Um, I, I actually am from a city near Rio, and I lived for 10 years in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And um, I was always very puzzled by how I was walking on the street in a very beautiful city, and I would frequently see military police cars passing. And because they, they, they used to have, I don't know if they still have that, but they used to have small cars and very large guns. So the rifles would point outside uh, of the window. Uh, and that was in Ipanema. You know, it's a, it's a famous neighborhood. There is a, one right, a famous right song beach. about exactly the <laughs> beach. Um, and, and, and you saw this interesting contrast between a situation of urban warfare and has been frequently described as a situation of urban warfare um, and a paradise-like uh, uh, side of the city. Um, and and the, 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 the origins and the, the, the role of violence, you know, in, in human society has always... Uh, interested me um, so so when I came to to the to London and then to the ISS I um, there was great interest at the time um, um, and still is about Latin America is 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 an area that I think London based think tanks have not done as much work as as perhaps they should um, and and it provides a wealth of um, information and uh, and lessons that have been neglected that are transferable to other regions as well. You know, I think about that all of the time. It is a, such a disappointment to me that people don't look at the case study of Colombia mm. winning a fight against a, a violent drug-based insurgency and the pressure that's coming on, the success of the Colombian model, now that Venezuela's collapse is creating a sanctuary, again, for violent group. Like, there's mm. so many lessons yeah. that we could be taking. Uh, even the, the way that American engagement with uh, the problem of drug trafficking in Mexico pushed it into Central America and how that connects to the refugee flow, like lots of important lessons. So thank you for your good work. What's your favorite book in your field? So um, this is an interesting field to pick a book from because it's still emerging and the debate about cities and 
how cities can think about security is very fragmented. So there's the strategic studies, the military community thinking one thing and others thinking. So one book that I think uh, uh, summarizes this debate and, and sets out uh, an agenda is Out of the Mountains by David Kilcullen. So David Kilcullen is a counterinsurgency practitioner uh, and author. Uh, he has served in Iraq and uh, in his book, he, uh, he actually makes a very good point about what you said of uh, the case studies from Latin America and other, and other regions um, for um, policy practitioners that are thinking about Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and he, he, ha he, he draws from examples from Rio de Janeiro, from Baghdad, um, about how, first, how cities are um, increasingly vulnerable to uh, non-state armed activities and uh, forms of insurgency because they are mm -hmm. hyper-connected, because they tend to be placed in, in littorals, in, in, in coastal areas, uh, and because of the sheer magnitude of uh, urban population growth recently. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a very good book. And the other one is one that is not quite a favorite book, but I think is one that is so thought-provoking that deserves attention. It's called If Mayors Rule the World by Benjamin Barber. Huh. So he makes a passionate case, and almost to a fault passionate, uh, about how local governments and mayors are by, by nature more... Um, more effective and more, um, uh, mo uh, more able to get things done than national, you know, federal level governments because mm -hmm. they tend to be less focused on the ideological, po highly politicized debates and they are driven to discipline by necessities such as, oh, we have to get the rubbish collected tomorrow, you know, yeah, and yeah, the yeah. pressure that these service provision sort of offers. Uh, he makes some very passionate points about how cities and local governments um, are, are better able than, than states to manage things like climate change mm -hmm. and even like uh, security, international security, to an extent that some of his points may not be actually, you know, it, it, yeah, you know, yeah. he, he reaches a bit too, too much. But um, his book, it's interesting to note, um, gave birth to a policy initiative, to a global um, initiative called the Global Parliament of Mayors um, that huh. gathers local governments. So they have a conference every year in which several mayors take part and they have permanent representatives and the, 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 the purpose is to debate policies, local policies, and make cities learn from each other and try to get the, um, uh, the demands or, or the, the, the requisitions of local governments to international fora like the United Nations and others. How interesting. What's the conventional wisdom in your field that you think is wrong? The, the thing that people treat as given that you would like to stomp out? So one thing that um, I try to I try to provide nuance when I'm talking to, uh, especially the military armed forces community, um, that is not exactly wrong, but I think sometimes is exaggerated, is the uh, perception that global urbanization, that rapid urbanization, which is unquestionably very scary and very, and very uh, um, momentous, uh, that this urbanization leads inevitably to warfare in uh, megacities. So this is usually meant as a, that usually leads to debates about increasing lethality of armed forces in cities um, and how to find the, the enemy and eliminate the enemy, which is perfectly okay from a military perspective because it's what they're constitutionally you know, uh, uh, mandated to do. However, I think it um, uh, underplays the role of local politics. God, you would think we had learned that in Iraq. Yes. <laughs> right? Like, that's the story of the invasion and occupation of Iraq before the surge. Exactly. And if you read the Iraq uh, report that was released by the UK, uh, was mandated by the UK government, it reads, uh, several, I haven't read it all, it's a huge document, but huge sections read as a manual on urban stabilization, you know, about the provision of urban services. So uh -huh. even though books like Out of the Mountains are not very common, there aren't many books that synthesize this sort of debate, there are so many, when I started reading more about 
settings outside of Latin America, I saw that a lot of the books about the war in Somalia are about urban security, about yeah. Mogadishu and Iraq, etc. So uh, what I try to tell uh, armed forces when I have the chance is that they need to pay more attention to the role of local politics, such as um, clan dynamics, tribal rivalries, you know, mm -hmm. um, and because sometimes it's, it's very rare for a highly powerful m paramilitary organization like the Islamic State to conquer a city and, and then right. you go there. What is more common um, is for clan militias and sometimes gangs uh, with uh, an indirect and sometimes direct role by um, a very powerful organization such as the Taliban in Karachi or the yeah. Taliban in Kabul. Uh, but they usually leverage these tensions and divisions in the urban environment um, to uh, achieve their, their goals. And that's where I think the role of diplomacy, if it looks more carefully at the local level, at the urban level, will be able to, 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 to do more on. And I think that's the, the, the ultimate pur purpose of our study here, the, our studies, to, 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 to conceive how our tools for international security and peace, how can be uh, improved by looking at the urban environment. Well said. And what's the work you've done that you most wish people would, if there was only one thing of your work that somebody could grab onto, what do you wish that would be? Okay, I will slightly cheat because I'll mention a second one, but I'll try to be quick. <laughs> so uh, one is that when I started looking at settings outside of Latin America, one of the first pieces I published that uh, incurred um, a, a very extensive literature review was published at the International Review of the Red Cross, and yeah, at a special edition they did at the time on war in cities. Uh, and the title of the, the article is Before and After Urban Warfare. So. Uh, it's about conflict prevention and uh, conflict transition in cities. So I do. Uh, I, I looked at the literature around conflict prevention, stabilization, peace building, um, and to see what is the level of uh, nuance and and understanding they they provide on on cities. And uh, spoiler alert, it's not much. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done on this field. And the other one is um, the report that we mentioned earlier um, that is coming out just around, around this time uh, called Illicit Order, the Militarized Logic of Organized Crime and Urban Security, which was um, in Rio de Janeiro, which was um, um, supported by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, which is a very interesting organization based in Geneva looking at organized crime around the world. Terrific. And my last question, since we are a data-driven organization, what's your favorite data visualization? So I really like the work that UN Habitat does. So UN Habitat is the UN body responsible for um, coordinating and, and doing policies uh, around urban areas. And um, they put out a very good report, um, I don't know if it's yearly or, or every two years, called the um, uh, Global Urbanization Prospects. And, um, and the, uh, they have an online tool called the Atlas of Urban Expansion. Huh. So it shows um, data very, very good, very well, uh, um, um, very well organized and uh, segregated data on population growth, on um, area growth. And the area growth of cities, they make a map since the 1950s to the 2000s. And you can see just the scale, uh, visually you can see the scale of uh, growth in many cities, uh, cities that have ex doubled their populations, trebled their populations um, in the space of half a century. So it's really, it really provides visual support to the unprecedented scale of urbanization in the world. It's called the Atlas of Urban Expansion. It's available freely online. That's great, and I've never seen it. Does it also look at historical uh, expansion? Because I'd love to see San Francisco before and after the gold rush. I, d I don't think it goes back that much, <laughs> but I'm sure that, that that is available in other in other in other books. Uh, but it really goes uh, from the 1950s, which was around the late 20th century, was really a time of uh, accelerated urbanization around the world. And uh, in percentage terms, uh, urbanization, urban population growth um, in, and, uh, w was higher in the late 20th century 
it is now sort of uh, in the 21st century, it has um, decelerated a bit, but in, in absolute terms, it's still huge. Yeah. But uh, the late 20th century was huge. And, and Latin America is, I think, the reason why it has so many interesting uh, facts and lessons is because it is currently the most urbanized of all developing regions. So it mm. has around 80% mm. of its population in cities. Africa has around fi less than 50%. Asia has around 50%. And uh, what did you say Latin America had? 80% in Eight Latin zero. America. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, but but the, the, the key thing is Asia and Africa are catching up very quickly. So mm. the urbanization mm. in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and Asia are proceeding very rapidly, so it is important to look at the lessons that a developing region like Latin America has to offer in order to, to better plan the cities of the future. Antonio Sampaio, thank you for coming to talk about your report, Illicit Order. Thank you for teaching us about the crucial link about governance, uh, failures of governance, uh, enabling violence, uh, gang, and illicit uh, economies in urban environments. Thank you for highlighting Dave Kilcullen's book, which I will go read, and uh, highlighting the way that, in particular, military folks think that urbanization inevitably leads to warfare, that we need to break that, uh, that, that connection that people naturally tend to make on that. Thank you for talking about your work from the ICRC on before and after urban warfare and for highlighting for us the UN Habitat data visualization, which we will post alongside this. Most of all, though, thank you for your excellent work for the IISS, Antonio Sampaio. Thank you.